then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Creator, Christ our Savior, and the Holy Spirit our Sustainer. Amen. First, I have to offer thanks. They're not here, but thanks to Pastor Mark Winning and to our own Brett Tuominen for leading worship these past three Sundays. I'm so glad you were in such good hands. And now, for me, I'm, I'm really grateful to be back. I had a wonderful vacation with my family, but I'm also now really grateful to be back in normal life at Cross and Crown. I love being your pastor. I really, really do. And as your pastor, I consider myself your partner. We all have our own roles, our own ministries, our own individual ways that we feel called to serve here at this church and this community, but I truly do consider myself your partner and you mine. There are a lot of ways to think about partnerships. You know, in this last busy month I've had with my family, one of the things that I did was that my husband and I celebrated our 27th wedding anniversary. It seems like we were married. <laughs>
So let's journey into this gospel story. Let's slow down. It's very different than how we do Bible study where we do the broad sweeping patterns. Now we're going to slow down and think of all the elements in this little story. We actually won't even cover all of the elements. There's so many. But let's unpack what this story has to say, some of the things anyway, between the lines, between the words, about who we are and who our God is, and as we are partners with God, who we are together in that partnership. First, let's look at Jesus. Let's take a good, long look at Jesus, who's not just showing us Jesus of Nazareth, who lived to 33 years old, but who shows us who God is all the time. Let's look at what kind of God you have. Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Now, synagogues were not the temple. It was different. The temple was thought to be the literal home of God. But synagogues were actually thought to be any group of Jewish Israelite gathering that wanted to learn about God. So he was there on the Sabbath, the seventh day, and teaching in the synagogue. Now, this was nothing new. The Gospels present Jesus regularly teaching in the synagogue, one synagogue or another. And the disciples called him rabbi, which is a Hebrew word that means teacher. So they already knew him as their teacher. And when he was in the middle of teaching, it's interesting to note, wasn't it the end where there was a natural pause in what he was saying? In the middle of teaching, he allowed himself to be interrupted. His agenda wasn't so strong. His purpose wasn't so set in stone that he wasn't open to the breaking through of a person and her needs. He was open enough to be flexible and change. Jesus cared about this person, this woman. He cared about her suffering. He cared about all that would go with her physical pain of having been bent over for 18 years. Can you imagine? Bent over. It's on your bulletin. We'll picture of that. Bent over for 18 years, as long as it takes to get from kindergarten through high school graduation. Imagine how that would limit your life. Physical pain, emotional pain, what does that do for a person to deal with that situation? And at that time, the social exclusion that she surely felt. Jesus saw her, even though she had been bent over and looking down, so she very well might not have even seen him. He saw her. That's the direction of grace. Not from the person being all perfect and doing everything right, but from God seeing a person. He saw her. He had compassion on her. Now, he could have just cared about himself, his family, the people there in the synagogue that he was teaching, so forth, people he personally knew, etc. But he cared about this person, this woman, who in her time would have had no social status. She was a female, first of all. She was bent over, meaning not seemingly healthy or prepared for childbearing, which at least would have given her social value. And so, Scripture calls her bound by Satan. Now, this term, bound by Satan, is an ancient way of saying that she was somehow outside of the will of God. Something wasn't right with her life. The writer of Luke, this gospel, he doesn't even bother to name her. We don't know her name. That's the case sometimes, actually quite often, with women in the Bible. So we have no idea of her name, and that's indicative of her social value in that place and that time to talk about women without naming them. But Jesus, to him, he sees something else. He sees something more. He stops his teaching. He calls her over to get closer to him. He places his hands upon her, this woman who probably has had little to no human uh, contact, touch. And he pronounced over her freedom. Freedom. This God is a God of freedom. Over and over in the Bible, we see the motif of people being set free from bondage into greater and greater freedom. And that's exactly what Jesus does here. Now, Jesus does not only heal this person, and he not only sets her free, but he does all of this on the Sabbath. In fact, here in Luke is the fourth of five times that Jesus heals on the Sabbath in this gospel book. Healing on the Sabbath is not a rare act. It's not some exceptional act for Jesus, something out of the norm. Instead, healing on the Sabbath to Jesus is part of what the Sabbath is for. It's 
part of the Sabbath's purpose. Now, this was a hot debate during the time when Jesus lived. God's law had said, don't work on the Sabbath. Now, we're aware of the Sabbath that came um, into the, the consciousness of the people in the book of uh, Exodus, where we get the Ten Commandments, and one of them is to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. We're told that it's representative, this Sabbath, of the last day of the week in the Garden of Eden, when God rested and rejoiced over what God had initially created. And so in our lives, when we encounter the Sabbath, we are also to rest and rejoice over what God has done. But further in the Bible, past Exodus in Deuteronomy, it talks also about the Sabbath, and it explains in Deuteronomy what the Sabbath is for. This is right out of Deuteronomy. Listen to this from chapter 5, 12 to 15. It says, Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, or your male or female slave, or your ox or your donkey, or any of your livestock, or the resident aliens in your town, so that your male and female slave may rest as well as you. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So, in Deuteronomy, it does say not to do any work, but it also does something more. It links the Sabbath with the freedom that the Israelites experienced when they once been slaves in Egypt, and then God brought them out of Egypt into safety and freedom. So, Jesus seems to be linking the Sabbath here, not just with the time of not working, but also with the time to set people free. That means that no matter who had a problem with him healing a person on this day, Jesus was not ignoring the law. Jesus was, in fact, fulfilling the Sabbath law by liberating a woman enslaved to her physical, emotional, and social conditions. For Jesus, freedom, liberation, and healing was what the Sabbath was. It was what the Sabbath did. He wasn't going to stop loving somebody who needed love just because it was unconventional, just because it was the Sabbath, or just because people didn't approve. There's plenty of love to go around for everybody all the time. Jesus is the act of liberating, healing, Savior of the world. So that's who God is in this story. What does this mean for you? Well, you are this woman. And so am I. So is every last one of us. You have had times in your life where you are bent over with something. Something. Stress, pain, grief, trauma, anger, anxiety, or life circumstances happening all around you, poverty, health issues, work issues, relationship concerns, something. Something has you feeling bent over now, or it has in the past, or it will in the future. You won't get out of this situation, and Jesus knows. Jesus cares. You will never go unnoticed. You will never be ignored. You will always have a defender in Jesus Christ. If you can't heal yourself, you're not expected to. God will. If you can't find a way out, that's okay. God will find your way out. If you can't stand up straight by your own willpower, don't worry. Let go and relax. God will stand you up straight. You don't have to manage all of this. You have a God. You have a God who sees you. You have a God who knows you. You have a God who cares for you and who will liberate and heal whatever in you that needs it. You're not alone. You're never alone. You're never unloved. You're never undefended. Even if everyone else wanted you ignored, like the crowd in the synagogue on that day, Jesus will not ignore you. Even if everyone else says you don't deserve love, that's not the opinion of Jesus, because you are a beloved child of God. You'll always be held deeply in the heart of God, and that means that God's available to help you anytime you need it. So we've looked at Jesus in this story. We've looked at who God is in this woman's life, and in my life, and in your life, and in the life of everybody on the planet. Now, let's look at this person. 
This person with a name that Jesus knows, but we don't know. This person lets us know something of humanity. Now it's important as we read biblical texts, especially this one, and well, there's others as well, that we not read this text as some kind of a, of a statement on people dealing with, living with, or suffering with disabilities. We don't want to suggest that this woman is broken because she has a physical limitation, or that Jesus has the will to somehow heal or fix, and however we think about, about it, physical limitations. We don't have all the intelligence of the universe. We don't know why people's bodies are made in a multitude of ways and why some people live with what we have commonly called disabilities. So this is not to suggest that something is wrong with people with any number of physical traits. Instead, see this story in the light of the line that calls her a daughter of Abraham, meaning accepted, whom Satan bound which suggests that something was outside of the will of God with her. Now, not all people with bent over backs are outside the will of God. Not all physical or emotional situations should be fixed instantly like Jesus is doing it right then. God has infinite intelligence and knows what needs changing in our lives and what does not. But this particular person, she was outside of the will of God in some way. But here's what's remarkable about her. Despite the fact that this woman couldn't stand up straight for 18 years, she found it within herself to go to where Jesus was. She was bent down, she couldn't look him in the eye, and she had every reason to give up hope that things could ever get better for her. And yet she put herself in his presence. That's such a, such a powerful lesson. Let that be a lesson to all of us from her. Don't just pray for healing. Expect it. Don't just hope Jesus will see you. Expect it. Her positive expectation made it possible for her to even be there in the synagogue on that day in the presence of her healer and her God. So Jesus knew her faith. Jesus knew her positive expectation. Jesus knew he could call on her. Her faith would allow her to accept this healing. So he pronounced her freedom. He placed his hands on her, and she immediately stood up straight, and she looked right into the eyes of God. Can you imagine how powerful that must have been? She had been looking down at the ground for 18 years. And then the second she was healed, she looked right into the eyes of God. Wow, what a healing. But she didn't see God's eyes first and then expect healing. She expected a miracle first when she saw nothing of him in front of her. When she knew nothing, when she felt nothing, only the situation of her being bent over. Her faith in the unseen is incredible. It's a model for us. So she looked into his eyes then when she was healed, and this, in the same sentence it says, she began praising God. Here's the thing. There are things that bend our backs, and we can expect healing, and we will get it. But there have also been things we've already been healed from. Most profoundly, we have all been healed, each of us, from what we human beings regularly push away, and that is the reality of death. We've been healed from death. We've been healed from the condemning nature of sin. We've been healed from the bondage and the captivity of trying to be our own Savior by following God's law perfectly, and we can't. Instead, we've been saved by a gift, by grace. Not law, not rules, not regulations, nothing that we earned, nothing that we somehow deserved, but grace, God's gift freely given. We have been healed. So how are we doing on praising these days, as she did? Do we look God in the eyes all the time? Yes, we do. God gives us glimpses of abundance and love 
partnership with the God who loves you. God loves each and every person perfectly, completely, fully. And God sets you free from all that binds you. Now may we then all respond with positive expectation, with gratitude, 